One of the most forgotten facts in our country's history is the constitution that we live with today was not the first constitution. The first constitution was actually the Articles of Confederation. It was approved by the Second Continental Congress in 1777 and then ratified by the 13 states. The Articles of Confederation set the stage for what America was originally intended to be, a league of states that held a military alliance with each other. Instead, we ended up with the Constitution that we have today, which created a centralized government that housed all the states under one roof, and all of them are under its control. Now, believe it or not, there was resistance to the new constitution when it was first proposed. Many of the colonists did not like the idea of a central federal government that would destroy the sovereignty of every state, and rightfully so. After all, they had just fought a war for their independence from one all-powerful government. Why implement another in their own homeland? Even if the new federal government wasn't intended to be an all-powerful bureaucracy, many saw the potential danger that it could. Those that rejected the newly proposed constitution were known as anti-federalists. Some of the most well-known anti-federalists were men such as Thomas Jefferson, Samuel Adams, and Patrick Henry. The anti-federalists lobbied hard against the new constitution. Many writings were published against it by anonymous authors. Their concerns were that the new government and the office of the president were going to have too much power or too much room to grow in power. Many anti-federalists also wrote about their concerns that the new government would cause a civil war, which of course it did in 1860. In 1786, James Madison and Alexander Hamilton began to work on a plan to replace the Articles of Confederation with a new constitution that focused on a centralized government. They also convinced George Washington to help them make their case, knowing that his popularity would help them to sway the state delegates. They then met with the Virginia delegates and convinced them to back the new constitution. Now, the date that American freedom started to die was May 25th, 1787. At a constitutional convention, the Virginia delegates led by James Madison convinced the other 13 states to, to support the new constitution, despite being told by their respective constituents back home not to do so. While the anti-federalist efforts to stop the creation of a centralized government may have failed, we do owe them credit for negotiating the Bill of Rights into the constitution. Thankfully, they had enough sway with their respective delegates to introduce the Bill of Rights to at least provide some sort of protection from government power. Now, I don't want you to get the idea that I'm being naive in this video. I know that there were legitimate reasons for replacing the Articles of Confederation with the Constitution. Before the Constitution, the Continental Congress was deep in debt after the Revolutionary War. It couldn't negotiate trade deals or enforce laws. There was also a lot of competition between states when it came to borders, land settlements out west, and trade deals. They saw themselves as individual states, and not as one large conglomerate nation. These were the major issues that drove our founding fathers to ratify the Constitution. But instead of creating a centralized government to solve these problems, why didn't Madison, Hamilton, and Washington instead use their influence to encourage discussion and discourse amongst the states? John Dickinson had previously attempted to create a tax to pay for the war and nearly succeeded in gaining the consent of all 13 states. Why not try again to create <clears throat> another temporary tax to pay off those debts? After all, colonists were not opposed to taxes, they just opposed being taxed without their consent. Deals can be reached between individual states without a corrupt government doing it for them. It's true that a country without a central government would have been very difficult to manage, but honestly, why should it be managed? Why should we be told that we have to have government in order to have peace and stability? Today we could easily live as 50 independent states that would simply hold an alliance with a central military and army as the Articles of Confederation originally intended. That's how it was supposed to be. We were not intended to be the United States of America. We were meant to be the independent states of America. And I firmly believe it's time for us to reject the need for government in our lives, because mankind can never truly be free unless it is free from government.